The letter to Philemon is the shortest of any of the undisputed letters of Paul. Scholars have a few questions about some of the letters, who they were written by, uh, whether they were written by Paul, but there are seven that they are certain were written by Paul, and of those, Philemon is the shortest. Um, so you don't have to stand, but please hear Paul's letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God, because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. One thing more, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The word of the Lord for us this day. Amen. The, the book, the letter of Philemon, is very personal, very personal, but it's not private. Notice it's addressed not only to Philemon, but to a Aphia, who may be his spouse, we're not sure, people in his household, and to the entire congregation of this house church, right? So it's not private, but it is personal, and much more than most letters in Paul, it is very particular to this situation. There's no general theology in it, which Paul often has in his letters. There's no doctrine. There's just a kind of a gospel message about Jesus Christ that has to do with reconciliation. Little information is given us on the context of this situation. And as you might guess, scholars over the centuries have speculated. Why did Onesimus run away? 
Why did, how did he wind up at Paul's? What happened after Paul sent him back? A lot of those historical pieces are not real certain. But let me just share for a moment some of the theories of why he ran away or why he moved from Philemon to Paul. Now, one theory is he ran away, he was captured, and he was thrown into prison with Paul. Coincidence? No, that's not a theory that's too widely accepted. Another theory is that he was dispatched by Philemon's congregation to minister to Paul in prison, that he was sent there. That was a common practice at the time. Many people who were in prison, of a certain sort of prisoner, were allowed to have people there with them, even sometimes a staff person to cater to their needs. Their food, their clothing was supplied by the family who would have access to them. But the text makes it sound as if he ran away. The text makes it sound that there's a broken relationship. So that theory doesn't seem very likely. Another theory that seems unlikely is that he was actually Philemon's brother and not a slave at all, but simply a servant of a lower caste, a lower class in the family. Mm. But this particular theory, and it's also based on the King James Version in which he is called not a slave, but a servant. But that interpretation, can you guess when that interpretation was popular? 1800s, when anti-slavery theology was a very important piece. Probably what is most likely is that he ran specifically to Paul in prison asking for Paul's help for some kind of broken relationship, possibly a misdeed on the part of Onesimus. But we don't know for sure because Paul says to Philemon in the letter, if he has done anything that I need to recompense you for, I will do it. Which implies that Paul isn't, isn't certain. We're, we're not sure that Onesimus stole anything or whatever. So the historical context of this situation, we will never know for sure. Now one of the things about, uh, that scholars often talk about with Paul is his position on slavery. Well, this letter is not about that. You do not know from this letter what Paul's position on slavery was. He seems to exhort his reader, Philemon, and those in that house church to free Onesimus and make him their equal. That seems clear. But it's not a general statement on Paul's part about where he stands in regard to slavery as a moral issue. He wanted the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus, as he seems to have wanted all relationships, to be based on love and not law. And he wants the choices that Philemon makes, the choices he's exhorting him to, to be choices of reconciliation, amen? That's pretty clear, and that they would nurture Philemon's faith. But I had to chuckle a little because when you actually read very closely, Paul was a very strong leader, amen? And that last question on your sermon supplement is actually for your discussion. Who started the Christian church? You can have that conversation over dinner with friends. But Paul was indisputably a very strong leader. So even though he says he wants to base it on love, a couple of times in the letter, he does something which is, if not intimidating, a call to reminder. He says, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. But he mentioned the duty, right? And then in verse 19b, he says, I say nothing. <laughs> I say nothing about your owing me even your own self, which scholars believe is a reference to the fact that Philemon, who was a Gentile, was converted to Christ through Paul. So when he says, owing me your very own self, he's like, your very own soul, right? And I thought of that, it's, it's kind of like the thing, it's like, I am saying nothing about the elephant sitting in the middle of the room. So he's trying to motivate them on the basis of love, but he gets a bit of law and he talks, he does things that say he wants to keep his own authority in relationship to them. 
So Paul had incredible gifts of leadership, and I invite you, uh, in, a, in a less than two minutes here of encounter, now I know a lot of us know some things about Paul, and, and, uh, and you can call on those if you want, but especially with regard to what you've heard in this very short letter, what are the qualities of leadership that Paul shows in this letter? Or, and or, that you know about him from other. What are the qualities? And we'll talk about that a little bit, and then we will move on. So turn to one or two people near you. You can turn to page 1088 if you want to for the letter, but you're not going to have very long to look at it. But there are some very good qualities of leadership that Paul expresses in that letter. So turn to someone near you, one or two people, and what are the qualities of leadership that you observe in that letter? So um, let's come back together. What qualities, what kind of things did you, did you hear in the letter um, that were uh, signs of Paul's leadership? Using the go through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. He, he claims his authority, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nate. Humility. I'm sorry? Humility. You're awesome. Humility. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he is, okay, so he, he appreciates, recognizes the gifts of others, and he affirms them. He lets Philemon know, and he lets Onesimus know, I mean, or he lets Philemon know, that he holds both of them as important to the future of this community. That's part of what good leaders do, right? Affirming people. Um, and uh, what else, anything else? He, um, one of the things that Paul does here that leaders, that good leadership involves also is he keeps the big picture in mind. Is he only concerned about Philemon and Onesimus getting along or why is he concerned about it? Because he is concerned in building the Christian community, right? So it's not just that they be um, reconciled um, uh, through Christ. I mean, that, that's kind of the core theology piece of it for themselves, but it's because their, be, their relationship being broken has implications for that entire house church and possibly the community and, po and for how they can move forward, right? So that's part of the, um, uh, the big picture that leaders need to keep in mind. And let's see, what else? Paul was good about timing. Now, I wish I knew more about the historical situation. How it is that he wrote that letter at this time. How long had Onesimus been with him in prison? We don't know for sure. Um, but we think that uh, Philemon um, and Onesimus were reconciled, and probably that Onesim Onesimus was given his freedom because in the book of Colossians, Onesimus is regarded to be a leader in Colossae at that point. And kind of related to what Nate mentioned, Paul's leadership, was, and you see this in the letter, uh, he claims his own authority and then the next, in the next verse he's humble, right? You kind of see both of those things going on and that's not uncommon I think with leaders as well. So, the title of the sermon is a book, a letter, but we call it a book of the Bible, right? A book, but not the whole story in 25 verses, because there's a lot we don't know. We think it all turned out well in terms of Onesimus and, and Philemon and their community, um, but we don't know what that original rupture, the brokenness in the relationship was about. And as I was reflecting on that, I thought, you know, a couple of things happen in long time broken relationships in people's lives. Now one of them is, um, which I have experienced to be the more, more common, um, which is, uh, the, this person did this to me, yeah, it was 37 years ago, but by cracky, I'm never gonna forget it, you know? And I base my life on that, and there's no transforming spirit of grace in there, for whatever reason. That's one, but there's another one, and this happens, and it kind of happens sometimes in intergenerational disputes, between like Hatfield and McCoys or whatever. Nobody remembers how it started, right? 
Well, I just don't like them. We haven't liked that family for three generations. So I thought about that. So Paul doesn't name the conflict. He doesn't, he doesn't identify what it was, if he knew, and he probably did. So maybe one of the things for us to learn is that sometimes, sometimes, we don't need to know the cause. We need to just let it go. So may this text be a catalyst for you this day to move forward toward whatever kind of reconciliations in your own life God is calling you to now. And God's people said, Amen.